We've got a special offer for Classics World viewers. Click on one of the two links in the description below to claim your free digital issue of Jaguar World or Classic Jaguar magazine. Well, we're here today at the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust Jaguar Collection, housed here in this purpose-built building at the British Motor Museum near Banbury in Warwickshire. It's a fantastic collection charting almost 100 years of Jaguar history, but as well as looking at all the fantastic exhibits here today, I'm also here to interview the editor of Classic Jaguar magazine, Ray Ingman. My family wasn't into cars at all, and a cousin of mine was the first one that got an Austin 1100. My next door neighbour, when in the 60s, had what I now know must have been a Mark IV Jaguar, which looked incredibly impressive, and I assumed it was a Rolls Royce or something. Well, my first ever Jaguar, I think I was 19, Exchange and Mark, £320 in Waltham Cross. Uh, British Racing Green Daimler Sovereign 420. Uh, XUR 577F with the sadness of people that can remember registration numbers. Where is it now? I existed with Mark IIs, S-types and what have you, and got into racing. And it was a few years later that I managed to buy my own E-type. I started racing back in 1982 with a 3.8 litre S-type Jaguar. Several forms of Jaguar Saloon, including one that uh, I took in part exchange for the racing S-Type and promptly crashed at Spa and broke my back. That got on to XJS's Became Attainable for racing. Very enjoyable they are too because they're sort of short wheelbase for the same reasons that Tom Wilkinshaw picked them, that because of the controversial flying buttresses, they're a very stiff shell. We started racing back in late 90s, company I owned at the time, Classic Spares, in conjunction with Kelsey and Jaguar World magazine, created and jointly sponsored a race series for them. Unashamedly, that was a bit of creating something for ourselves to do because there weren't many XJSs out there racing at the time. Yeah, Jaguars in motorsport on a professional level. I was first tempted back to that that I found some photographs of the uh, Group 44 XJR at Le Mans and I went out there. That was a period of time that I'd drive to Le Mans. I think the Formula One thing, it, it seemed very good at the time to get Jaguar into the market, get their name in the marketplace, but it was probably a little ill-advised. It's been nice to see the occasional F-Type out there. Money no object, I'd like to own a genuine lightweight E-Type Jaguar. Four WPD would be my preference, but any of the original 12 I wouldn't be terribly fussed. XJ12 Coupe. I thought that that was a car that really again captured Jaguar's innate elegance. Uh, obviously it had its faults like wind noise if you drove jolly quickly in it. Very elegant superbly powerful, uh, lovely car. Uh, Project 8, which I've been lucky enough to work with, and something with my sense of humour, I would have the four seat one with the isofix in the back. I've driven them on the road, I've driven them on the track, and despite looking somewhat excessive, they are a real Jekyll and Hyde car that you could drive it down to Tesco's with your children in the back, or you can take it to the Nürburgring. My real moment was that going to Le Mans in 88 at the wheel of my V12 coupe. For some reason we were needing to leave late and get down there but that's an abiding memory and obviously that's coloured by the fact that when we were there we then witnessed Jaguars winning um, for the first time since the D-Type. This is where it all started right? The yeah. Swallow sidecars of course. As in SS? Yes. Uh, next year will be the centenary because it was 1922 that William Lyons and uh, William Walmsley did the sidecar stuff. This is more your stuff, isn't it? The Le Mans, Le yeah, Mans races? I actually saw a Group 44's race at Le Mans. And uh, again, the Walkinshaw XJS's, I was there for that. And uh, so, yeah. And aren't your earliest Jaguar memories around here? Yeah, this, this, this is, whilst I'm not absolutely sure, it definitely looked like a Mark IV. I can remember the huge headlamps on my uh, neighbour's car and spotted the Leaping Cat, which was the clue that it might well be a Jaguar. Because obviously they did a Mark IV and a Mark V and didn't they then have to skip Mark VI out of deference to Bentley? Well, that was it, it was a trademark of Bentley at the time. A uh, Series 2 XJ here, the Daimler. Random, Daimler. Random plar version which for some reason in modern idiom has got colour coded. Some people, like if you look at the, uh, the vent there, for some reason that was way ahead of its time colour coding. So that's, that's standard, that's not being oversprayed or something? In the... No, I, I first thought I thought it was a cheap respray, but really. <laughs> it 
and this is this is more your bag this is the v12 is, coupe right this is one of my favorite cars the v12 coupe i've actually driven this very one as well and strangely again whilst jaguars are associated with leather this one has the velour trim which became quite a thing at the time so many have been retrofitted with leather i am um, i really like the coupe as well i think it's gorgeous and there was a delay in coming out wasn't there from when it was first shown and it was only known on sale for a couple of years i think it was a tragedy that they didn't keep this going so here we've got a, what a late a fairly late xjs in fact i've driven this one it this is, is the, they can't come any later phil it's the last one the last six liter v12 they really were getting pretty sophisticated now with the engine management on them. And this here is a four-wheel drive one. Was this like a mule for what would have been the XJ41, the F-Type, I think? Yeah, it's, it's intriguing that in looking through parts books of, of uh, GKN and what have you, parts for the four-wheel drive were listed. Really? Never... So it got that close to coming into production yeah, that it was actually as a parts book. Suppliers were listing brake calipers and things for them. ALC, the advanced lightweight concept, wasn't it? Yeah. That sort of predates the X150 XK. Yeah, but so close to production, isn't it, really? When you, when you look at the car, well, well, it was probably at the time taken to be a styling exercise and none of us realised well, it was going to be the real thing. I think I know the story behind this because um, this obviously came out well after the actual final design had been signed off. But this was introduced um, at, at one of the motor shows, I can't remember if it was Frankfurt or Paris, but in the year that they they closed Browns Lane. So of course there was all this negative publicity about the closure of Browns Lane and Jaguar pulling out of Coventry. And this was a positive spin. And we even did a photo shoot of this down in uh, Westminster mm -hmm. with the London Eye behind it and everything. Because it was just, it was something positive to look forward to, a new car, a new investment in Jaguar. And it, it did the trick. I don't know what you think about the XJ40 Coupe, given that the yeah. Original one is definitely one of your favourite cars. Well, I've got one thing against it. Pillars. Oh, of course, the yes. The thing over there is it's, when the windows are down, it's pillarless. That's a really good point. Original F-Type, as it would have been known, the XJ41, mm. which uh, just got a bit too heavy and bloated and expensive and complicated, so that's why Ford canned it. There were so many times that the F-Type was going to be used. I think that the last time, the rumour was that the the car that became the DB7 yeah. was, like, it was a clever way by Ford of revitalising Aston Martin, but that was slated to be the F-Type. It was probably quite a good way of also moving the development costs somewhere else, I imagine. Yeah. Some accountancy trick. Yeah. We can't have a tour around a Jaguar collection without looking at the XK, of course, in its yeah. various guises. The theme that goes on with Jaguar development from the, the much like the 380 type from the purest 120. The 140 gets a little heavier, uh, but better developed in as much as that's got a steering box, that's got a steering rack. Right. So they updated it, drum brakes, and eventually onto disc brakes with the 150. So, so is the XK150 is the one to go for, particularly if you're using it for, say, touring and things. Oh, in, in modern day usage, yes. But then again, there's a huge marketplace for upgrading the earlier cars so that they can look original, but have... Because I think the styling in the XK120 is better. I think it's a purer shape. Absolutely. By far and away. I mean, this is again comparing the 380 with the Series 3. Yeah. It's kind of the same. Yeah. We always come back to that. Yes, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. What a fantastic collection of cars, though. I think it's been, a, it's a real good, Amazing, good trip round, you know, what, almost 100 years of Jaguar history. Yeah. There's more Jaguar stuff over in the main museum as well, of yeah. course, so, uh, so it's always worth a look. So, uh, well, it's been good walking around with you, eh? So, uh, yeah, yeah thanks for that. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs>